This is an audio sermon recorded at the Church of Christ at Johnson Mill in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 3801 Johnson Mill Boulevard. Philippians chapter 4 beginning in verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul gives us a lot of exhortation here when he's writing to the church at Philippi, and he's writing to you and I today, and he tells us where our mind should be focused. A big chunk of that tells us if there be any per- virtue, if there be any praise, to think upon those good things and those lovely things. What I'd like to do for a little while this morning is really break down this passage and break it down into a few different chunks, and let's deep dive into it and see what Paul is really talking to us about. So let's have a better understanding of what our mindset needs to be from this day forward as Christians. So let's start it over there, beginning in verse 4 again. We're going to read verse 4 through 7. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Right there in verse 6, it says to be careful for nothing. When you look up that word careful, it means to be anxious. So to be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about things. It says instead of worrying about things, but let everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. We talked about right when we started out how we tend to worry about things we try to take in our own control. And when we worry about those things, we're being anxious for those things. Paul is telling us, instead of doing that, give it over to God. Let your requests be made known to God. Let Him help you. You know, we worry about bills. We worry about our schedules. We worry about keeping up with the Jones, and we don't even know who the Joneses are. We worry about all these different things. We worry about health care. We worry about rising costs. We worry about the national economy. We worry about all these different things that we have zero control over. And yet we still worry about them. We tend to, tr- to stress about a lot of things in our society. And this stress will affect your body in negative ways. When you look up stress, and you can look up studies and medical studies about those, stress always leads to high blood pressure, lack of sleep, mood swings, you age faster, and etc. Stress will lead to all these things. And if you want one of the best examples we've got, look at the president's. Look at pictures of presidents before they take office, and then just four years later or eight years later, look at those side-by-side pictures of them and tell me that stress doesn't affect you. When you look at those side-by-side comparisons in just four to eight years, that's not a very long time. It is drastic differences of how their body looks and, and their energy level and everything. And a lot of that is about stress. And we stress about things that haven't even happened. Have you ever asked yourself, well, what am I going to do if this happens? What am I going to do if this happens? Well, guess what? That hasn't happened, and it probably won't happen. And yet we still stress about those things. In Psalms chapter 118, verse 8, it says, It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. When we're, when we're stressing about these things, we're being anxious, and we're having anxiety about all these things, you're putting your confidence in yourself. And you're saying to yourself, how am I going to handle this situation? Well, instead... What if we put our trust in God, as Psalms tells us? Put your trust in the Lord and say, well, God's going to carry me through. What's the worst thing that can happen? Well, even if that does happen, God is still going to be with you. It says that he's never going to leave you or forsake you. So we can have confidence in that. We can trust him in those. 
Jeremiah chapter, 20, chapter 9, verse 23 and 24 says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. God's telling us that even if you've been blessed and you have all these things, you, that's not where your glory should be. That's not where your confidence should be. Your glory and confidence should be in knowing and understanding the Lord and having a relationship with Him. We have a great example of this in the book of Daniel. And a lot of, this, a lot of us have heard this story before. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now let's think about this story for a little bit. What you have is you have these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then you have the king, Nebuchadnezzar. The king wanted them, him to bow down to his golden image. And these men were not going to do it. So the king said, if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you into this fiery furnace. And this furnace was burning pretty hot, and he was going to throw them all in there. Listen to the confidence from these three guys. In verse 17, if it be so, if you throw us into this fiery furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of that hand. You hear the confidence? The confidence not in themselves, confidence is in God to deliver them. Now, we tend to stress about things that probably won't happen. I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a second. They're standing there, and they're facing the king, and the fiery furnace is right there. And the king is saying, if you don't bow down to this image, I'm going to throw you into that fiery furnace. Do you think that they could have been worried about that? We worry about things that haven't happened, and they're worrying, they could be worrying about things that's right beside them, that they're going to be thrown into this fiery furnace, but they're not. They're not worried because they have confidence in the Lord. And then look at verse 18. But if not, if God doesn't deliver us from the fiery furnace, we're still going to trust in Him. We're still going to have confidence in God because we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image. They had full trust and confidence into the Lord to deliver them. And God did just that. And just as God delivered them from the fiery furnace, that same God is your God that you and I worship today. It's the same God that can deliver you from any situations that you may face in your life. So we don't have any reason to worry either. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it says, And fear not which is able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It's telling us that even if these other people come to persecute us, like King Nebuchadnezzar was going to persecute these guys, even if we have other people going to face us, we shouldn't fear them. There is one person, one being that we should fear, and that's God. The one person that can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the only fear that we should have. Everything else, we can put trust and confidence in God to deliver us out of that. We have another example <clears throat> where it's Jesus, and it's the night before he's going upon the cross. Now, I want you to think about this for a little bit. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen. He knew all the torment. He knew all the tribulation. He knew all the hardships that he was about to face. You know, it says that when he went on the cross, that the sins of the entire world was put upon him. I want you to think about that for a second. Have you ever had someone sin against you? Maybe tell a little lie or maybe steal something from you? Just one little sin. How does that make you feel? It's pretty crummy, doesn't it? Now, I want you to think of that one little sin, how it makes you feel, and then think about the sins of the entire world from the beginning of time until the end of time is all put upon one man, and that's Jesus Christ. Think about that hardship and that burden of what he felt when he went upon the cross. It's not a pleasant experience. We have the physical tribulation, we have the hardship, we have the mental tribulation and the anguish. We have where God had to turn away from him at that point because he was carrying all the sins. We have all this hardship going against Jesus, and Jesus knew this was going to happen. He had every right to be worried about these things. Listen to what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, it says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, 
O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus was doing what we're commanded to do in Philippians. Instead of being anxious, instead of worrying and trying to put it all upon himself, he fell to his face and he prayed to God. That's what we're taught to do. Pray with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. That's what Jesus did. And he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way that we can save the human race and we can save them from a world of sin, let's go that way. If there's anything that we can do, and then remember how he ended it. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. He's always praying for God's will and shows us that he has trust and confidence in God, that God knows what he's doing. He has a plan, and that plan will be fulfilled. So Jesus has given us that great example. Psalms chapter 55, verse 22, it says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never the suffer the righteous to be moved. This is what Jesus was doing. He's casting his burden upon the Lord. He's praying to God, and he's giving him everything that he needs to make it through whatever hardships he was going to face. That same God that delivered these men from the fiery furnace and the same God that was with Jesus and helped him go through the cross and raise him up from the dead is the same God that we serve. That's the same God that can help you through whatever you may face. So when we worry and we stress and we try to put the confidence in ourself, we're not doing what Philippians tells us. Instead, let's put our confidence in God. And this is going to take some training. It's going to take some time to condition your mind to act that way, to make sure that we're doing that. Let's go back to Philippians and let's read the next couple verses. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. What it's telling us here in Philippians is it's all going to start with your mindset. It's all going to start with what you think about on a consistent basis. And he's given us what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about th those things that are true, that are honest, that are just and pure. Think upon those things. Make sure that those are what's directing your mindset and leading you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. What he's telling us here, that word prove means to test. Test everything. Anything that's in your life, your friends, things that you watch on TV, books you read, people that you hang out with, places you go, everything that you've got, test them against the scriptures that we know is our standard of truth. And once you test them, you're going to find some of those things are good. And it's telling us to hold on to those things that are good. Do them more. And then you're going to find some things that are not so good. And it's going to tell us to abstain from those, push them away. And it's not just things that are evil, but it says abstain from all appearance of evil. Even if it has the appearance that it could be evil, get away from it. Push it away from your life as much as possible. So it's pretty easy. You're standing here, you're, you're looking at things that's in your life, you're testing against the, strip, the scriptures. If it's good, you go to that which is good. If it's evil, you push away that's what's evil. So you're constantly moving more and more towards what that's good and thinking upon things that are pure and lovely. And it starts with your mindset. You know, we have a saying that we talk about at work, and that saying is what you focus on expands. And when you look at these things, when you think about things in your life, if you're constantly looking for positive, pure, and lovely things, you're going to find a whole lot more positive, pure, and lovely things in your life. If you're thinking about those things, if you're focusing on those things, if you're looking for negative things, if you're looking how everybody's out to get you, how the world is just such an evil place and there's no good out there, well, that's what you're going to find too. What you focus on expands. And you, the great thing is you get the choice of what you want to focus on. In Philippians, he's telling us to focus on the good, the pure, the lovely. And that's your choice. You have the choice to focus upon those things. Psalms chapter 101, verse 3, it says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And then in verse 6, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. So here it tells us exactly what was going on in 1 Thessalonians. The psalmist is writing, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I'm going to push it away. I hate it. It will not cleave to me, and I'm going to only focus on the things that are faithful, that are good, 
He's that walks in a perfect way. I'm going to spend the, as much time with him as I possibly can. So this is where it starts with your mindset. It's how you think about those, these things. Now remember the title of the lesson is to train how you think. This is a training process. You don't expect to be per perfect on this overnight. So what you want to look at is we want to focus on progress, not perfection. How can I be just a little bit better today upon how I think, how I see the world, how I see other people than I was yesterday? How can I just be a little bit better? Once you focus on these things and you, you start doing with your mindset, the next thing you have to do is take action. Let's go back and look at Philippians 4 again. When you look at Philippians 4 and you go to verse 9, Paul is saying, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. That one word, do, it's just two letters, is a very huge and powerful word. That means take action. Once you're thinking about these things that are true, you're thinking about these things that are honest and just, and you've seen common practices of how you should be a disciple for Christ and how you should walk for Him, do them. Put those things in your life. Take action. And then it says, when you take action, that the God of peace shall be with you. What you'll find is when you take action, especially action to serve God and to serve other people, and to see how you can be the best fit in the kingdom, you're going to find a whole lot more good and lovely and honest things that you can focus on, which will then give you more action that you can take. So what it's going to happen is it's going to start this spiral effect. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him a man which built a house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell and great was the fall of it. What you have here is Jesus has given them a parable, and he's given two groups of people. So you have one group of people that they built a house, and it didn't fall. You have one group of people they built a house, and it did fall. There's only one difference in these two groups of people. It says that, Therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. Okay, so you've got one group that they heard the sayings, and they did them. And then you've got the other group. In verse 26, they hear these sayings of mine, and doeth them not. The groups of people, both groups of people, still heard the same sayings. They heard what Christ was teaching them to do. They heard the same thing. But one group actually did them. The other group didn't do them. The group that did the sayings that they were supposed to do, and they did what, what Christ taught them, they still had the rains came, the floods came, the winds blew. They still had the hardships of life still beat upon them. But their house didn't fall. Now the group who did not do what Christ taught them, they had the rains come, the floods come, the winds blew. Same thing, but their house fell. The main difference that we see is one group took action. When they learned what they should be doing, they applied it to the life to the best of their ability. And the other group didn't. When you apply the sayings of Christ to your life, you're going to face hardships. You're going to face hardships no matter what. It doesn't matter what group you're in. The hardships are going to come. The rains are going to come, and the floods are going to come. You'll be able to withstand these rains and floods if you will take action and perform the work of a disciple. Do what Christ has taught you to do. If you don't, then those rains and floods can easily wash you away. And that's where you get the choice. You have to have the foundation that is centered around Christ. <clears throat> and some of those responsibilities that we know we need to do is to visit with each other, pray for one another, help the needy, count your blessings. We have all these different things that we know what we need to be taught. It's basic. It's basic information that we teach our children when they're growing up. We know what we need to do. And sometimes it, it feels like a great responsibility and it feels like a great discipline of what you have to do to put it forth in your life until it becomes a habit. So for instance, going to visit the sick. Sometimes that feels like you've really got to go out of your way to go visit the sick. You got to find a way to squeeze it into your schedule to cut something else out of your life and sometimes that's hard until you do it so often it becomes a habit and then that's just who you are that's what you do you're a disciple of christ and you go visit those that are sick and then it's not very hard and it's the same thing that, that keeps going and all that will will continue to develop and, and continue to turn into a habit 
which will further your mindset to focus on the things that are good and pure and lovely. So what we have here, here's a psychological cycle that we have, and this is through everything that, that you can think of. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to start at the top, and that top is where it's programming. So your programming is going to lead to your thoughts. Your thoughts are going to lead to your feelings. Your feelings will lead to actions, and your actions are going to give you a result. That result is going to further your programming. So here's how to explain that a little bit. So your programming is kind of like information that comes in. If you think about your mind as a computer, if you have a programmer for a computer, they input information into that computer so it will dictate a certain action for that computer to take. Well, your mind is really no different. Your mind is receiving information all the time. Now, the great thing is you get to choose what information that you're receiving. You get to choose your programming. That information that comes into your mind is going to dictate a thought. And that thought could be a good thought, it could be a bad thought, it could be a neutral thought. It's just a thought. So the information you receive is going to dictate a thought. That thought is going to dictate a feeling. So now once you think about something, then you're going to have a feeling. How do you feel about that certain situation? Is that a good situation? Is that a bad situation? Is it a neutral situation? That's how you feel about it. That feeling is going to lead you to take some sort of action. Now one thing to keep in mind, inaction is still an action. So when you have this feeling and it leads you to take an action, it's going to spur you to do something. Then once you take that action, you will get a result. Now that result that you get, it could be a positive result, it could be a negative result, but whatever that result you're going to get is going to feed you more information, which goes back to programming, and then the cycle starts over. This has happened 24 hours a day, all the time. Programming leads to thoughts, thoughts leads to feelings, your feelings will lead to actions, your actions are going to give you a result, which is then going to give you more programming. So let me kind of give you an example of how that works. Let's use an example of, of spending time with your Christian family. Let's say that somebody hasn't visited you in a while. Maybe you haven't spent time with your Christian family for a while. So then that's going to lead, that's the programming that you're receiving. You haven't spent time with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's the information coming in your head. That's going to lead to a thought, and that thought could be, well, maybe nobody wants to spend time with me. Maybe I don't have the relationships with my brothers and sisters that I really want to have. Maybe they don't like me. That's going to lead to these thoughts. That thought is going to generate a feeling. That feeling is not going to be a very good feeling. That feeling is going to be a feeling of, of we don't have a place of belonging. We don't have a sense of community. We don't have brothers and sisters that, that we love and care about that really want to take care of us. That feeling is going to generate an action. Most likely that action is going to be you start back, back paddling, right? You get in your house and you close off everybody you, so you don't spend any more time with them and you really become more inclusive with yourself. What kind of results is that going to lead for you? If you really just stick to yourself, the results you're going to get is you're not going to spend time with more of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not going to receive the edification and exhortation from your, your fellow Christian family. And that's going to be your result. Well, we can obviously see that result is going to dictate even more programming that we don't have a sense of belonging. We don't have the good family Christian that, that we need to be. So you can see it starts to spiral. Now that example I gave you was a spiral effect going downward. Now here's the great thing. That spiral effect can go upward as well. So maybe the programming is I got a visit from my brother or sister. They love me. They love to spend time with me. So the thought that I have, the thought that I have is I have this sense of belonging. I have this community. I have these Christians that care about me. And that's a feeling of goodness. You feel good when you belong. You feel good when you're included. That is going to lead you to take an action. Hopefully that action is that you will go spread the love. You'll go take that and you'll go spend time with more brothers and sisters and you'll go give some exhortation and edification to them. That's going to give you a positive result. That positive result is going to be a great feeling and as a community and as a whole we continue to grow together, which is going to further your program and it's going to continue it on. So you can see that you have programming will lead to your thoughts, feelings, actions, and a result. It can either go downward or it can go upward. Now here's the great thing about all this is you get the choice of which way do you want it to go. You can change your programming and you can change your actions. The programming of how to change it from a negative to positive is you can read the Bible, you can listen to audio sermons, you can choose who you, the people who you spend time with. 
You can choose what information you're receiving in your life. You can choose that programming. So if right now you're having a negative spiral in your life, and this is a psychological cycle, and it's taking you down, or it feels like you're being drug away from the church for any reason, you can change that, and it's your choice. You can also change your actions. Let's say the programming you're receiving is, has been negative, and that's leading to negative thoughts and negative feelings. Well, guess what? That doesn't have to lead to your actions. You can break that cycle. And you can say, well, I understand, and maybe nobody's visited me, or maybe I haven't spent time with anybody, but, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to set time this week, and I'm going to go spend time with somebody. I'm going to change that cycle with my action. That action is going to automatically change and go, instead of from a negative, it's going to automatically go to a positive. Th some of those actions could be meditating, could be praying, could be serving others, visiting or calling their brethren, and it could be as simple as counting your blessings. These things is you get the choice. So when we're talking about training how we think, you get to choose how you think. You get to choose your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. These are your choice by what you put in front of you. Continuing on in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What Paul is writing us, is he's telling us to be content with our blessings while we're looking forward to that eternal blessing of, with that home in heaven. So what we have here is when we think back about what we've read about in Philippians, we're training how we think. We're looking at the good, the pure, the lovely. A lot, a lot of times it seems like what we stress about is, like I said, one of them is stressing about keeping up with the Jones. Well, if we would just slow down long enough and count our own blessings and look at what God has blessed us with, there's probably a lot of people trying to keep up with you. And it's not good or bad, it's just part of it. If We need to sometimes just slow down and take an inventory of our own life, of what God has blessed us with, and be content with those blessings. So be content with what God has blessed you with while you're constantly striving to be better and looking for that eternal home with Him in heaven. So focus on what's to come. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says, Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we're learning to have patience here on earth while we're suffering tribulation. You know, we talked a little bit about that parable in Matthew where the rains came and the floods came and the winds blew. Tribulations are going to happen. If you're not facing any tribulations right now, well, just wait because they're coming. I don't know how quickly they're coming, but they're coming. They're coming for all of us. Maybe some of you are facing tribulations right now. Congratulations. That's good. Tribulation can be a good thing. They can further your patience and your hope in Jesus if you let it. You know, having a positive mind and having a positive outlook in life, it doesn't mean that you don't have hard times. It just means that you know how to handle them because you put your trust and confidence in God. When you put your trust and confidence in God, you can handle anything. John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, These things I have spoken unto you that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be a good cheer, I have overcome the world. This is Jesus talking to us here. Jesus has overcome the world so much so that he was able to defeat death. He's the author of our salvation. And since he was able to defeat the world and defeat death, he gives us the way that we can defeat it as well. We're going to have tribulation in the world. We'll promise that. It's going to happen. And when we face that tribulation, we know that we have that surety and hope through Jesus. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, it says, confirming the, souls of the, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. We can kind of look at, at going through hardships to enter the kingdom of God. It's kind of like a passageway. We have to go through some of these tribulations. We have to go through some of these hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. It says that we must... We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. It's going to happen. So when you're going through, through this tribulation and through this hardship, as long as you're focused on continually putting your trust and confidence in God and making sure that your mind is staying on the pure and lovely things, then you know you're doing the right thing. You know you're going in the right direction. You know, there's some 
some religions out there, some denominations, that they'll teach you if you're going through hardships, if you're facing some, some troubles in your life or some strife in your life, then that must mean you're sick spiritually, that something spiritually is going on with your life. And I'm just here to tell you that is completely bogus. That if you're going through hardships in your life, then you're going through hardships in your life. Jesus promised that we would go through it. That does not mean that anything is going wrong spiritually. That just means we all face hard times. We all face tribulations. It's just part of life. It's part of Satan against you. When you're going through these hard things, remember to focus on God. Focus on His promises and His blessings. So that's what we need to be focused on as we continue on. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and to honor and to glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Sometimes these trials and these hardships that we face can kind of be a blessing in disguise. These hardships and trials sometimes will help us to turn back towards God when we haven't been following God. You know, when you look in the Old Testament and you look at the Israelites, continually, over and over and over again, God said, don't forget me. Don't forget the works that I've done for you. Now, I want you to think about your own life. Have you ever had a point in your life where it was just really going good? Maybe your job was going good, your relationships are going good, everything's just kind of easy and it's on, on just a nice, smooth surface. It's just going well. Were you thanking God during those times or did you forget about Him? A lot of times we forget about Him. A lot of times we just get so caught up in how good our world is going, we forget that God is the one who gives you those blessings. And then vice versa is true as well. Have you ever had times in your life where, man, it just, it's low? It feels like everything is going against you. Most of the time, that's when we turn back to God, isn't it? We turn back to Him for our Savior, for help. And that's good to turn to Him for your Savior and help. And the point of this verse is what it's telling us, that the trial of your faith, when you're facing those hard times, you're having persecutions, it's helping you to make sure you're focusing and you're looking for that appearing of Jesus Christ. So it could be a blessing in disguise. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure we're constantly looking at those things that are pure, that are lovely, that are good report. Just as it talks about in Philippians. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. With the proper mindset, you will be able to understand and even benefit from hard times in your life. Or, with a negative mindset, not looking at those things that are good and pure and lovely, you can allow these hardships to completely destroy you. It's your choice. How you want to see things, how you want to look at things. And this is, takes a training of your mind, which once again, it's the constant progression of getting better. It's not about perfection, it's about progress. Just get a little bit better today than what you were yesterday. The trials you're facing today will be of no concern to you soon. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. It doesn't matter how, how hard this life is. They will be of no concern. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I want you to think for just a second, who is writing this? This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. If you've studied a little bit about Paul's life, you know that his life was not so easy. He took quite a few missionary journeys. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was thrown in jail. He was stoned to the point where everybody thought he had died. He had a pretty, pretty rough life, and it was because of his faith in Christ. And it, he even says, for our light affliction, all those things that he faced, he considered it a light affliction. And it was only going to last for a moment. And there was a purpose for that light affliction, that it would help him grow stronger. And it help him make sure that he's not looking at the things which are seen, the things that are around him. He's looking at the things which are not seen, that eternal home with heaven, the spiritual things. And that gives us the edification of what we should be doing as well. 
Don't get so caught up in the hardships in your life, the things that you get so stressed about, the things we stress about which haven't even happened. Don't get so caught up in those things, but get caught up in the things that are spiritual. Make sure we're focusing on those things that we can't see. Look for those. We have a much greater place of where we're going as long as we keep this right mindset and make sure God is always our priority. By having the right mindset, training how we think, looking for those, the good and the positive things, the peace that we're going to have during those times is going to be unexplainable to other people. Others are going to notice you and your example, and they're going to want to know how you have that peace when you face these tribulations. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Think about when you see somebody going through all these hard times and they're still as solid as a rock because they're putting their trust and confidence in God. They're staying faithful. They're continuing on. They're walking the course. Think about how those people inspire you to continue for, to, for you to be better, to always look at how you can make sure you're staying strong. They're being a light to you. They're being that example. Well, you can be that light to other people as well. It's much bigger than just helping yourself. We think about having a positive mindset. Think about keeping our trust and confidence in God. Obviously, that's going to help you as a Christian. And it's going to help all those that are around you because you're going to be a positive influence and example to them as well. When we become the new man that we're called to be, we're given an opportunity to change our entire outlook of life to be a more positive person, which is full of hope. Full of hope through Jesus. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism and death, that, likewise, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We are freed from sin when we're baptized into Christ. Many here this morning, you have been baptized into Christ. You have obeyed the gospel and decided to follow him. If you've been baptized into him and you've crucified that old man of sin and you're continually walking with the Christ, what do you have to worry about? How bad is this life going to get where you don't put your trust and confidence in God? If you've been washed and cleansed and you've been taking those sins away from your life, you can rest with the surety and hope that you will be raised up with Christ. You will have that resurrection. Remember, we talked about how Christ defeated the world in death. He was able to overcome death, and he gives you the opportunity to overcome death as well. So what do we really have to worry about? We know we have a better place to come in heaven. Now, if you haven't been baptized into Christ this morning, well, you might have something to worry about. And that's something to worry about is you don't have that hope of eternal home in heaven. Instead, we know of that other place who goes who don't, doesn't follow Christ. They don't wash away in sins. Hades, we know that place in, in hell that we go to, and the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, all the hardships, where it's continually burning, but it's never burned up. We know all those hardships, so you might be a little bit worried this morning, and you have every right to be. So you get the choice, and when you're going to train how you think, you get the choice of if you're going to focus on the good and the positive things, the blessings that you receive from God, the surety that you have that home with Him in heaven someday, or you get the choice of all the negative things in your life, the hardships that you're facing. Maybe you don't have that hope in heaven with Jesus. If you haven't obeyed him in, in the gospel of baptism, you haven't washed away your sins and become that new man. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. To receive new sermons each week, subscribe on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening, and God bless.